Hello. Namaskar. I don't like that podium because I'm too short and, you know, only my face shows. So it's like a disembodied head talking. So my topic today is temples, textiles and travel, the three sutri of Bharatiyata. I dedicate this talk to Sri Ranga Hariji, to the memory of Sri Ranga Hariji. There's a reason for it. His last book was about the Prithvi Sukta and my speech actually has a lot of references to Prithvi Sukta. And when Nandakumarji told me that Ranga Hariji's last book was about a commentary on Prithvi Sukta, I take it as a personal benediction to me, his final uh, book. So uh, I'm basically a storyteller. Before I go on to my topic, I want to start with an anecdote. Last year, during Pitru Paksha, 15 days, I was traveling through five different Indian states. My home state of Goa, the place where I stay, Maharashtra, Tamil Nadu, Madhya Pradesh and Assam, just in 15 days. The people there, they looked different from each other, obviously. They spoke different languages. They ate different kind of food. They, uh, they, they had uh, different kind of uh, things in pretty much every way. But yet, in all these five states, they offered Tarpanam to their ancestors. And they offered Tarpanam to their ancestors to the tune of the same Sanskrit chants, which were the same from Tamil Nadu to Assam. And this is not a phenomenon of 2022. Our people have been doing it for thousands of years and that is the sutra that binds Bharat together. There is a fashion these days of saying and uh, Nanda Kumarji spoke about it of uh, deracinated journalists and even politicians coming up with saying that there was no Bharat before the British left. There was no Bharat before 1947. We are just an artificial uh, construct that the British left. There was no such country called Bharatavarsha. Not true. Bharatavarsha as a civilizational concept, as a civilizational whole, has been in existence in India since the beginning of time. And Raghav has spoken a little about it. So let me go to the Prithvi Sukta which is a 63 hymn sukta dedicated to the motherland, to the Matra Bhumi in the Atharva Veda. It starts off by saying, Mata Prithvi Putroham. Mother is the earth. They say earth, they don't say Bharata in that particular hymn. They talk about Bharata later. But in 63 hymns, they describe the country as a country that was the venue of Vishnudev's exploits, as the sacred land that Indra protected, as the land that is full of Udyamis, that is entrepreneurs, full of Krishaks, that is agriculturists, and full of Shilpins, that is artists. They describe the land as a land peopled with I snow clad mountains on one side and a samudra on the other side. They talk about a land which is watered by fertile rivers. They talk about the land which has so many khanijas, so many mineral deposits. They talk about the land that is sanctified by yajyas. All this tell me what other land could it describe? Can you think of any other land? Any other Matrabhumi that description, this description would fit? Anyone? Name one country, one other country to which this description fits. Everything that I've said. They were describing Bharat without mentioning Bharat and they were saying that this is our holy land, this is our Pavitra Bhumi, this is the Bhumi of Bharat and I am her son, the Rishi who wrote, who composed this hymn. And that is the Sutra of Bharatiyata that has held this country together since the time of the Vedas. The Vishnu Dharma Purana, of course, Rishi Loma Harshana, he describes Bharat as Bharat. And he says that from the Himalayas in the north to the sea in the south, Bharat is the Varsha, the land that falls in between is Bharat. And the people who live here, Bharati Tatra Santati, People who live here are known as Bharatis. We are her children. This is Bharat. 
so what has been keeping this country together what is the glue what is that one thing that is keeping this very diverse country which is diverse in every which way it's diverse geographically it's diverse in languages it's diverse in cuisines it's diverse in lokachara it's diverse in multitude of ways but it still was a civilizational whole so what was that one thing that was keeping this country together that is dharma and dharma as manifested in three things temples textiles and travel to temples and textiles how i'll explain it to you in a bit and this is not just me saying it foreign travelers to this country have been saying it for more than 2000 years from pliny the elder who came, who wrote about india 2000 years ago where he has praised india's textile to uh, huan sang who came to bharat 1300 years ago and who traveled the length and breadth of bharat and he has talked about the places of pilgrimage he's talked about the kumbh mela he's talked about going to kanchi he's talked about going to banaras to al beruni who visited india 1000 years ago he has also made detailed notes about bharatiya culture about bharatiya clothing about bharatiya way of worship about temples to tavarnie who visited bharat almost 500 years ago and he has also mentioned the same thing and he has mentioned something very important he is saying that in all the other country he was a frenchman who was traveling to india through many other countries and he is actually saying that in all the countries that he visited the elite the richest the most fashionable people were wearing clothes made in india they were so highly in demand they were so expensive and they were considered so fashionable that the richest most educated most cultured people in all of these countries would say that i will wear clothes only made in india that was another thing that held bharat together now how did this tradition of pilgrimage to temples come into being when did it come into being it has been in existence in india for thousands of years because when the rishis described the land so accurately define the borders so well they even the prithvi sukta also says that this land is peopled by people who speak different languages and nana dharmani is the phrase that they use they have different ways of worship how could they have discovered this if they had not visited the length and breadth of india it's just not physically possible so our rishis our siddhas our tapasis had traveled across the length and breadth of india in pilgrimages and they had established these holy teerthas which a teertha by the way in sanskrit is a place where you can cross over you can cross over from where not the road you can cross over from the secular plane from the material plane into a sacred plane into a higher plane those were the places of transmission uh, i mean transformation those were the places where you would go because the the act of doing pilgrimage to these places would fundamentally transform you those were places which already had high divine energy and over the thousands of years where the siddhas meditated where the rishis meditated where the devotees went and prayed with all their heart the energy just kept on increasing which is why when you go to a pilgrimage when you go to a teertha like kedarnath or rameshwaram you find a different kind of energy and if you let it transform yourself it will transform you if you are a shiva bhakta you could go to rameshwaram you could go to kedarnath you could go to somnath you could go to kashi all of these places are located in the four different corners of the country and it was the devout hindu's dream to visit all these four places and there were certain rituals made for it like you were supposed to get ganga water from kashi and you were supposed to do abhishekam to the lingam in rameshwaram uh of uh, with the water and this is a practice that is followed by thousands and thousands hundreds of thousands of people in india even today a few years ago when i had gone to hampi 
I met people from a small village in MP. They were traveling, they had some, I think, almost 100 buses. And they were traveling, they had started their journey from the village in Madhya Pradesh, then they had gone to Kashi. And from Kashi, they were carrying Ganga water and they were going all the way to Rameshwaram. And they were traveling the way Tirthayatris do. They carried their food, they carried their stuff. They had no place to stay. They had not booked hotels or anything. They would just stop near a temple, near a Tirthakshetra, do darshan at the temple and camp outside near that, take a bath in the river, cook for themselves, do darshan, move on next day to the next temple. And that time they had come to Hampi to do the darshan at Virupaksha. After that they were supposed to go further down south. So this is what S.N. Agarwal, who has written a monumental book on the pilgrimages of India, has described as the great civilizational churn. When people traveled from their hometowns to places of pilgrimage, in ancient times, they often traveled on foot. Sometimes they carried their food, sometimes they were reliant on the hospitality of the people they met along the way. And they stayed there, there was a lot of exchange happening. They were talking, they were exchanging notes on cuisine, they were exchanging music, they were exchanging, they were singing bhajans, they were exchanging literature. And that is how this great concept known as Bharatiyata was slowly taking shape. Now where do textiles come here? If you study the textile clusters in India even today, you will realize that many of the textile cluster, clusters even today are in and around temple towns. When Huan Sang had come to India in 643 CE, he has spoken about textile clusters in Kanchi. There is a textile cluster in Kanchi even today. He has talked about a textile cluster in Kashi. There is a textile cluster in Kashi even today. He has talked about textile clusters in Puri. They exist even today. Even today, temple towns in the south, like Sri Kalahasti, they still have their own crafts, their own weaves, their own uh, idiom of art. It's continuing even today, despite so many transitions, despite so many transitions of political power, because that is what keeps Bharat together. And consider the diversity. If you were a Shiva Bhakta, you would go to the Shiva temples scattered across the country. If you were a Shakta or a Devi Bhakta, you had 108 Shakti Pithas to go to, starting from Hinglaj, which is in today's Baluchistan, all the way to Kamakya, which is right at the other end of the country in Assam. If you were a Vishnu Bhakta, you had to go to Badri, you had to go to Dwarka, you had to go to Ayodhya, you had to go to Sri Rangam. Again, the deity is common. The, the God that you worship is Sri Vishnu. But the ways of worship, the architecture of the temple is different, but the divine energy, the transformative power of the place is the same. That is why you have the concept of 108 Divya Desams, where the Alvar sang 108 Vishnu temples. So imagine those days, how they must have traveled all the way to Rudraprayag or all the way to Badri from Tamil Nadu and sung the, uh, sung the song, sung the, the Divya Pravandam songs there. How was it even possible? It was possible because this entire country breathed the same air of Bharatiyata. We are a culture where in Kanchipuram, there's a very, very beautiful temple called Kailashnath Koil. I don't know how many people uh, have seen it. That was built by the Pallavas, who ruled from Kanchi. Now, they had an intergenerational rivalry with the Chalukyas of Badami for generations. So, one generation, Kanchi would win, the Pallavas would win, another generation, the Vatapi kings would win. So, the king of Vatapi, um, Vikramaditya, he, Vikramaditya won, he defeated the king of Kanchi and he came to Kanchi like a victor. Now we know of history where foreign invaders, when they enter a city like a victor, what do they do? The first thing they do is they destroy every place of worship that belongs to the vanquished. They loot, they plunder, they burn, they rape, they take people as slaves. What did Vikramaditya do? He went to the Kailasnath Koil. He said, I've heard that there is this very beautiful coil here. I want to see it. 
he went and saw the temple and he was so enamored by the beauty of it by the beauty of the carvings that he said in my kingdom i want to build a temple which is just like this but which is even better and then he went he probably carried some of the shilpins from here and he built a temple known as the virupaksha temple at patadakal which is based on the same similar kind of architecture as the kailashnath kovil the story doesn't end here and mind you the kailashnath kovil is named after mountain kailash which is 3000 kilometers away from kanji most people who were building the temple probably hadn't even seen hadn't even been anywhere beyond 100 kilometers of their uh, village or where they hailed from but they still named the temple after the lord of kailasa so anyway to continue the story the political wheel took another turn and the rashtrakutas defeated the chalukyas and the rashtrakutas saw this temple both these temples actually and they said we want to build an even bigger temple in our territory but we want it even more different and something that nobody can copy so they built a very similar temple but they carved it out of a monolithic rock and they called it the kailash temple of elora which exists in maharashtra today that is a three story temple which is carved top down from a single hill like the mahabalipuram temples again they named it after the lord of kailashnath that is our culture we do not destroy we add we create so this tradition of yatras and pilgrimages has been in continuance in bharat for thousands of years when huan sang talks about the magh mela in prayag he says that so many people had come here to take a bath at the holy confluence of the ganga and the yamuna and the saraswati how did they get to know how did they get to know that it's a month of magh how did they get to know that this is the precise planetary position where they need to come here and take a bath there was no whatsapp in those days there were no phone calls there was no social media there was no way to gather everybody on twitter saying that hey we are going to worship in this place but people still made it at the right time at the right point at the right precise location at the right precise planetary con uh, configuration to take a bath that is because that is civilizational knowledge that is very very deeply embedded within us so where did this stupid idea of there is no india before the british there was no country before the british left where did it come from first time it started by one guy called john strake who was a civil servant and he every time he gave a orientation to the newer people who used to work under him he used to start with this thing that there was never an india there never is an india and there never will be an india because it was a it was a narrative convenient to him if he could establish that there was no country to begin with it's just a con con conglomeration of places then it makes the british rule legitimate that is the same reason why they came up with this aryan invasion theory also if you establish that the first people who came here were colonizers from outside that somehow legitimizes the british coming here and colonizing us so this was a massive lie that was told to us about there never was any india before and there never will be any india and sadly that is a life that is a lie that is being parent being parroted even today so all this is talk i want to show you how we are one how we were always one i can show it to you in a very nice colorful way through the journey of a motif the peacock only one because i don't have the time and once you see that you will know that this is one motif that has been with us as a civilization as a culture since the sindhu saraswati civilization days it is a motif that is common to our our scriptures it is a motif that is common to our literature it is a motif that is common to temple architecture it is a motif common to paintings it is a motif common to dance music you name it all the arts and crafts that we have the peacock is present and it is the most colorful ambassador of our culture move on uh, so this is peacock in a tanjore style painting next please 
so we see the pictorial representation of the peacock as a motif for the first time in the cave paintings of bhimbetka where you can see that there is a man who is trying to uh, probably hunt the peacock next please now we come to sindhu saraswati civilization pottery where if you see on the right you will see a peacock and there is something inside its stomach now experts have been saying that the painting inside the peacock stomach is actually a soul so the peacock had a function had a auspicious religious function he would take the atman the sukshma sharira from one life to another and that is again a basic civilizational concept the concept of punarjanma the concept of the sukshma sharira leaving the stula sharira when physical death happens and moving on to a newer loka moving on to a newer life next please now we come to peacock in dharma in temple sculptures and you see that we see peacock everywhere in the south part of bharat as the vahana of skanda and this is a very very beautiful swami malai bronze of skanda sitting on a parrot on a peacock and you will see this different kind of peacocks being depicted whenever skanda is depicted next please this is the peacock on the torana of sanchi this is a much 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 earlier uh, structure and you can see that how stylistically the peacock has been portrayed now this peacock is very different the portrayal of it the actual physical sculpting of it is very different from the peacock we saw earlier as a vahana of skanda but you know that that was also a peacock this is also a peacock that is again a very essential characteristic of indian art where as long as you keep to the broad concept you have enough creative freedom to converge and diverge so you see that in music also for example a same karnatic kriti if ms subalakshmi sings it and if maharaj puram sandaram sings it there will be slight differences but the raga will be the same the shruti will be the same the aroha avroha will be the same but the individual artist also has the creative freedom to diverge and then converge to diverge and then converge next please now this is again a very very beautiful depiction of uh, skanda in aihole where he is actually fighting sura padman and you can see that his body language it is so aggressive it is so lively it is so active and even the peacock the the kind of expression that the peacock has it's also very ferocious it's a very beautiful bird it's a very calming bird and it is used as a very calming bird in a lot of places but here even the mount of skanda is very war like next please this is a beautiful peacock on the hoysala temple there is a entire line where they have the peacocks and the musicians and here the peacock is a thing of beauty it is depicting beauty it is depicting serenity it is depicting the good things in life pleasurable things in life next please this is a surasundari and she is holding a peacock because peacocks were kept as pets as well in royal households and she is see see her grace see the way she is standing see how she is holding the peacock and how comely the peacock is looking the whole uh, the whole overwhelming mood of this sculpture is very uh, very gentle very beautiful very feminine next please uh, this this one this one i think it is an aihole next please this is uh, in uh, himachal pradesh yeah this is in jageshwar or bageshwar i forgot where this i went recently and i have so many photos in my phone that i'm kind of getting jumbled but this is definitely either bageshwar or jageshwar group of temples in uttarakhand ha huh, jageshwar so next please this is on the fort in jaisalmer now here it's a pure decorative element there is no auspiciousness attached to this this is secular architecture this is not temple sculpture this is uh, the palace but even there they've used the peacock motif because the peacock motif symbolizes pur purity it symbolizes passion it symbolizes beauty next please 
This is actually outside India. This is the famous peacock window in Bhaktapur in Nepal. Those who have gone will know. This is to tell you that Bharatiyata is not limited to what are the geographical boundaries of Bharat today. Bharatiyata is a concept that embraces what is today's Afghanistan, what is today's Nepal, a lot of other countries which are no longer a part of Bharat, but they were once part of this civilizational entity, this civilizational construct called Bharat. Next please. This is uh, in Mahablipuram. There is a panel where they show a lot of animals. There is a monkey there, there is an elephant there, but there is also a peacock there. Next please. This is again Pallava art. Next please. This is Mailapur. Kapalishwara temple. And this is obviously much later, this art has been created much, much, much later. But even there, they have stayed true to the motif and they've used the peacock. And of course, the colors are more lurid. The presentation is not as refined and artistic as it was earlier. But the peacockness of the peacock is still there. Because that is the peacockness of this peacock is a metaphor for the Bharatiyata in us Bharatiyas. Next, please. This is also another modern, like contemporary temples in Tamil Nadu, a peacock in that. Next, please. This is Skanda, but in Odisha. This is, uh, yes. So now the thing is, if you see the depiction of Skanda, which I showed in the beginning, and you, sh you see Skanda here, you see that everything is different. Even the facial features are different. Even the way he's sitting is different. Even uh, the, the form, the Pratima Lakshana is the same, the proportion is the same. But if uh, you know that it's Skanda, because we are all Indians and we are all Hindus. But if I show these two pictures, to some foreign citizen and ask them if these two pictures, the first, the Swami Malai bronze and this one, and ask them, are they the pictures of the same deity? I don't think they'll be able to say yes. But we know because we have the civilizational connect and we know intuitively that there is a God who is carrying a spear, who has a peacock. It has to be Skanda. Next, please. This is one of the yoginis who also has the peacock as the mount. This is in, this is in Hirapur. Next, please. This is the clay art. This is again Skanda. But this is the terracotta temples in Bengal. Now, yeah. But again, if you see the way he's dressed, the way he's standing, his body proportion, his face, it's very different from the Skanda you see on the Parshurameshwar temple or the Skanda you see in the Swami Malai bronze. But it's the same God. It has the same ayudhas, it has the same depiction, it has the same mount, it has the same story, it has the same religious significance, everything is the same. But this is the depiction that the artist in Bengal did it. Next please. So you see Peacock in the paintings as well. This painting is a very famous Ravi Verma painting of Saraswati and uh, Peacock. And this is Krishna, this is calendar art. This is Krishna with Peacocks. Next please. Now we find peacock on coinage. So that is, uh, these are Skanda Gupta's coins. And you can see that's again Skanda. And you can see that he's minted on, uh, as uh, riding a peacock. Next please. Now we come to the peacock in contemporary architecture, in secular architecture. See the, the thread called Bharatiyata, it pervades in the sacred, yes but we also carry it in the secular. There is no clear distinction because for us everything is a yagya, everything is secular, everything is connected to the root that we call Bharatiyata. So this is a, a palace in Jaipur where they use the peacock as a very beautiful motif. This is actually a Jain hall of meditation which is being designed in the shape of a pichi, the peacock fan which the Jain monks use to sweep the floor and that's how they have created this meditation hall. Next please. This is of course peacock in the weaves and again if you see these are these are these are both kanchi weaves 
and if you can see the depiction of the peacock in this that will replicate the peacock as it is shown in the temple sculpture in kanjipuram it will not look like the peacock in banarasi sarees it will look completely different because they have copied it from their temple motifs and the artists the weavers in kanjipuram have got their inspiration peacock in nature of course but also the peacock sculptures that they have seen in the temples of kanjipuram so this is a pallava peacock again that is a very very uh, temple architecture inspired peacock next please so now this is actually a peacock from banaras the one on left and you can see that it's a same peacock but the way it's depicted it's very different that is again the same diversity in unity sort of thing that plays out in bharat again and again unity in diversity not diversity in unity diversity in unity is what the india alliance does the previous one please the one on the right is the peacock in patan patola paintings patan patola sarees so here again you see that it's a def different depiction of peacock and if you see the peacock carvings in the patan uh, pa step well you will find peacocks with exaggerated plumage like this there because they got their inspiration from the carvings on the patan pato patan step well next please so this is a peacock in fulkari on the left embroidery now we move a different art form this is a peacock in can anyone identify what is this art form what is this embroidery called kasuti so again the kasuti peacock is very different it's the peacock everybody can make out that it's a peacock but they have their own aesthetics they have their own language they have their own art idiom which is likely inspired by the temples in that region next please this is peacock in the gujarati kachi embroidery on the left and that is the peacock in kantha in bengal next please this is the peacock in zardozi next please now here again uh, previous one so this is a embroidery which became very popular after the advent of islamic rule in india and you can see that now there is lot of exaggerated plumage exaggerated colors because somewhere the spirituality of the motif has been stripped down and it has remained merely a decorative motif the bharatiyata is being diluted somewhere and that is why you see so much of lurid colors so much of uh, so much so much of exaggerated plumage in this next please this is peacock in the ragamala paintings this is the peacock that i showed earlier <coughs> in tanjore paintings next please this is peacock in shri kala hasti kalamkari next please this is peacock in gond paintings now the vanwasi societies in bharat they have their own stories they have their own legends of creation they have their own beliefs and those beliefs are very much in line with the bharatiya concept the dharmic concept of finding religion or finding spirituality in anything so they have their own legend and they depict it through these paintings where they show the peacock under the tree of life next please this is peacock in varli paintings again they have their own uh, own legend of creation so they show the peacock they are basically a vanwasi community which is heavily dependent on agriculture so the rainy season is a time of great joy for them and when peacocks dance with their plumage full out that means that the rain has been good that means you are going to get good crops that means the gods are happy and their god who is basically a form of lord shiva is always accompanied by this peacock with the full plumage next please now we come to peacock in metal craft i am showing these different art forms to you because i want you to understand that ultimately there is only one thing that is connected to all these disparate art forms that is the concept of bharatiyata and that is thousands and thousands of years old that has been there in the sindhu saraswati civilization that has been there in the vedic uh, richas and that is with us even today next please oh the right one is a beautiful depiction in dhokra art of uh, bastar in chatisgarh where they have shown the peacock as a boat in which shri ram 
Janaki and Lakshman are crossing the Sharayu and there is a there is a boatman there. Now this is what is known as a what today's people would call today's new age woke people would call a subaltern depiction of <laughs> the peacock. But ultimately, it's telling the same story of Sri Ram, Janaki, and Lakshman crossing the Sharayu River. Next, please. So peacock in jewelry. Next, please. <coughs> Peacock in contemporary pop culture. So now we have come to a point where the peacock has been stripped of all religious associations, all spiritual associations, and it is now just a motif to be used in contemporary culture. So you see it anywhere. Next, please. It's there in logos. Next, please. And it's there in the ultimate expression of pop art. It is there on the back of trucks. So the motif has been there with us from the Sindhu Saraswati civilization to the trucks that you see on the road even today. That is what is known as Bharatiyata. And that is the elusive thing that has kept us together. That has made us believe in this concept of Bharata Varsha. Even though there was political disunity, even though there were many kingdoms here and there. But we believed in the same dharma, we believed in the same spiritual concepts, we believed in the same spiritual thread that bind us together. And this is not just unique to Hindus. All Indic dharmas, Buddhists have their own sacred geography. They have their own stupas, they have their own chaityas, they have their own caves that are scattered all over the country and they take undertake pilgrimages to them. Jains have their own places of pilgrimage where the Tirthankaras lived, starting from Tamil Nadu, going all the way to Odisha, to Assam, everywhere. So all dharmic faiths whose destiny, whose existence is inexplicably and permanently linked to this sacred land called Bharat have had this sacred geography because that was the way to keep the country together. So that is why I say that temples, textiles and travels to temples and by temples I don't mean just Hindu temples, I mean Jain temples also, I mean Buddhist temples also. Even the youngest faith in Bharat, Sikhism, has its own pilgrimage because many Sikhs actually trace the path of Guru Nanak Dev. So he went to Puri, that's why they go to Puri, where he composed his most famous song, which is Gagan Me Thal, where the story goes that he was not allowed inside. So he said that I will do the Aarti of uh, Sri Jagannath and uh, heaven is my Aarti Thali and uh, the sun and the moon are my Diyas. What a beautiful concept. We, somebody talked about Shankar Dev, Sriman Shankar Dev, I think it was Manushi. He traveled all over India. And then he went to Assam and then he started his, uh, his, uh, his doctrine. Uh, Adi Shankaracharya travelled all over India and he established the four mathas. And he did this Digvijaya twice. Swami Vivekanand went on a Bharat Brahman to understand what this country is all about, to understand what is this underlying unity in diversity is all about. Even the saints like uh, Ramdas Swami or Namdev have also travelled across India and even today the best way to understand the pulse of this country, best way to understand this thread of spiritualism that is connecting this elusive principle called Bharatiyata is to travel to temples and to textiles. Thank you.